Okay, so uh, welcome along to the Problem Structuring Methods Special Interest Group. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining this session and um, welcome to uh, Graham Forbes. So we're delighted that Graham can join us. We've had uh, over the, the last uh, sort of probably about five or six months, some very uh, interesting discussions about the, the overlap between um, philosophy and systems thinking. And so this this was a sort of natural development, I think, uh, to, to look at and um, sort of where the two meet. And as so I've always found it fascinating. And so I, I hope you will uh, all enjoy uh, this, this as a session. So over to you, Graham. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so just a, a bit of an introduction. Um, I was a philosopher at the University of Kent for nine years um, and then last year for various reasons um, I went for a change so I did a degree in business analytics which I've just finished um, and got into problem structuring methods which turn out to be what OR calls the stuff I've been doing for the previous nine years so um, I was just fascinated from the off by the fact that, that there was this overlap. And then I got into systems thinking and I thought this sounds very familiar. This sounds almost exactly like process philosophy, which is a particular school of thought in philosophy um, that I was familiar with in my background as a philosopher of time. Um, and then I started reading slightly more and realized that not only do they sound similar, but they have a shared heritage. If you look back into the, the origins of systems thinking, you can kind of see the connections. So what I'm gonna to do today um, is work out how to advance it. Yeah, so I'm gonna go through a brief thing about the, the philosophical origins of systems thinking and just to, to draw out the fact that there's there's been an overlap from the very beginning. I'm gonna explain what process philosophy is, and I'm going to put that in context of the kind of history of mainstream, mainly Anglophone philosophical thought in the 20th century. And um, there's going to be a bit of French and German stuff in there as well. Um, but just so you can kind of see how those origins that are shared between systems thinking and process philosophy have kind of developed to where we are now. Um, I'm going to very, very briefly um, think about some of the big hallmarks of systems thinking in, in contemporary operational research, and then think about what process philosophers are telling us to do. And then there's one slide at the end that might actually be useful to anybody in which I sort of come out with some heuristics from process philosophy that are meant to be useful for problem structuring and Maybe they're just stuff you're going, hey, we just do this as, system, as systems thinkers anyway. Or they may be things that you're going, right, this is something that fits so nicely with systems thinking, we should, we should be doing more of it. Um, okay, so, so systems thinking, hard to summarize pass, partially because most of you will know more about it than me. And it's just always intimidating to come into a room and start telling people about their own field. Um, but these seem to be sort of crude generalizations that I've picked up um, in, in the sort of literature on systems thinking. So in general, we're dealing with holes rather than parts. We're looking at, at systems rather than sort of tiny things um, that, that we can we build up into something. We're dealing with things that sort of make sense as a unity. Um, though, though of course, these holes might be part of even larger holes themselves. We're interested in complexity and chaos. And I'm using chaos here in the kind of mathematical sense of something where you make small adjustments and it produces big effects in a system. So you change the angle in your game of snooker and the final position of the balls ends up being totally different. Um, and we're dealing with complex systems. Um, so complexity theory comes into play. That means our ability to, um, to predict stuff gets trickier and our ability to measure things with sort of very simple performance indicators gets trickier. Often systems thinkers rely on some kind of analogy with biology. 
Certainly people like Stafford Beer, who are into cybernetics, are very keen on thinking about um, about how brains work. Um, but you get lots of appeals to, rather than thinking of this on the model of um, tiny billiard balls bashing into each other, which was the sort of 17th century philosophical scientific approach, um, start thinking about analogies with with ecosystems or something. And that analogy with biology gives us lots of fractal structures, so structures that contain other structures that that are similarly structured, um, and sort of iterative things where if we're wanting to understand something, we do a number of recursions to improve our understanding. We, we don't just understand it from the beginning and then we're done. What we do is we come to a first pass, we get some feedback and we sort of go through. So these hopefully are kind of familiar platitudes about systems thinking. Um, okay, so systems thinking and philosophy. So I went through a book on systems thinkers that I found um, and just <laughs> did a find on the word philosophy, you know, sort of looked in the index on the word philosophy, just did a find and found the mentions of philosophy. And I found, you know, we've got Ludwig von Bertalnfi, um, almost certainly butchered that as a name, but he studied philosophy and physics under Moritz Schlick. Um, C. Church Westman studied philosophy under Edgar Singer, who in turn studied under William James. The names Schlick and James are gonna come up again. Then Russell Ackoff studied under Churchman and Singer. So we've got this sort of inheritance from, from James carrying on. Um, Donald Schoen writes his PhD thesis on Dewey's theory of inquiry. Now, Dewey, again, hugely influenced by William James. Um, they're both part of the American pragmatist school, as we're about to see. And then we get people like Stuart Kaufman, who studied philosophy at Dartford and then at Oxford, presumably with something else, because Oxford, um, oh, maybe it was postgrad, I guess. Um, Michael Jackson studied PPE at Oxford, because at undergraduate, famously, you can't do philosophy by itself. You always have to do it with something. Um, and the stuff that I've read a bit more of. So Stafford Beer, Peter Checkland, and John Mingers, they literally spend pages in various publications talking about the philosophical provenance of their ideas and really engaging with the philosophical, um, the sort of the, the history of philosophy that they find. So the idea that I'm coming in and sort of trying to shoehorn some philosophy in um, I mean, I'm assuming you, you were all here because you don't think it's shoehorning, but in my defensive moments, I can defend against that. So here's um, a nice bit from Checkland, uh, 1999, where he goes, right, so this, his approach really inspired by C.D. Broad's mind in its place in nature. Um, as it happens, C.D. Broad, um, who was a philosopher at Cambridge University in the 1920s, his scientific thought is one of the main works that my PhD was inspired by. So I know C.D. Broad reasonably well. Um, largely known as explaining stuff that Whitehead thought much more coherently for a general audience. So occasionally people complain about Charlie Dunbar Broad for not being original enough because he's getting all his good stuff off Whitehead. Um, but then Checkland goes on to say, other examples could have been selected. Philosophically, the work of Bradley in 1893 um, or Whitehead's difficult process philosophy, which argues against the validity of common sense predication in describing reality, represent the same movement. So. Checkland's sort of admitting Whitehead would have done, it's just Broad is much clearer as a writer. I think that's entirely fair comment, um, given the options I would read Broad too. Um, but process philosophy as a name is very much attached um, to Alfred North Whitehead and his 1929 process and reality um, is the most famous work for this, but it's something he continued on his whole career. 
and it's uh, a movement that continues to this day, um, as we're going to see towards the end in some um, quotes from some recent process philosophers. So I think there's a lot in common between systems thinking and process philosophy, but there are some really important differences. So one of the really important differences is that process philosophy is a philosophical view primarily rather than an approach to thinking that we might use um, in operational research. So process philosophy is making a claim about metaphysics. Um, it's used, in fact, in a huge number of disciplines. I had a PhD student who came and sat in on my metaphysics course because they were doing their PhD on process philosophy and political theory. Um, but it's a view about the nature of reality. Um, so your genuine process philosopher isn't going to accept that this is merely an approach to thinking about things. They're going to say, no, no, this is a, a description of how things are. And it is opposed to substance ontology. We're going to hear more about that in a bit. Um, so what is its claim about reality? Its claim about reality is that reality is a dynamic interacting of various processes. So we've got various processes, they're interacting with each other and they're doing so over time. So those two key elements, the over time and we're not understanding processes by themselves, we're understanding them as interacting with other processes. Those are the two things you need to know about process philosophy to blag your way in a conversation with a philosopher, um, as I have done many a time. Okay, so this is a bit, um, it's just kind of useful background of what philosophers have been up to. Um, and obviously this diagram could have gone back to Heraclitus in, what's it, 400 something, 500 BC, but you know, one of the pre-Socratics, so before even Aristotle, um, who said, Panta Ray, everything flows. So some people call him the original process philosopher. Um, as a slight danger and anachronism there, but he, he was definitely the first person in the Western tradition to really take the idea that things are constantly changing at the center of philosophy. Um, but we get the whole of Greek philosophy. Um, that leads on to Roman philosophy, Islamic philosophy, which leads on to medieval Catholic philosophy. Um, that leads into the scientific revolution and you get sort of Descartes and Newton and Leibniz. Um, and then you get the first really significant figure that I was annoyed not to fit on this picture, which was Immanuel Kant. So basically philosophy is in a job of responding to Immanuel Kant, who really got philosophers worried about whether we had any evidence to make claims about how the world is. So, so metaphysics is in crisis with Kant, um, and there are kind of two responses to Kant. One is to go for a Hegelian approach, and the other is to go for a Humean approach. So um, the Humean approach really tries to double down on, on the empiricist scientific method. We really care about what we can observe. If you look at this approach, you will basically see hard OR in the 18th century like it's where it all comes from. And that approach goes into people like Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, and you really get the very origins of hard, hard OR with this. So Jeremy ben Bentham, um, his utilitarianism inspires work just using maths to work out what London's sewage capacity is to, to build those huge Victorian sewers they did it was off the basis of this philosophical stuff that we had with with this kind of Humean approach that comes through. And then you get um, the other response to Kant, which is 
um, to think about the role of the mind in constructing reality a lot more. So after Kant, we get this idea that anything we say involves some combination of what we as thinkers are bringing to it and what the world is bringing to it. The empiricist tries to get rid of us as much as possible. That's the main criticism of them. They get rid of us too much and they can't actually say anything. Um, the Hegelian brings us in a lot more. Um, so we get Hegelian idealism and we get British idealism, which is a specifically British version of this. And we get a whole bunch of other responses to Hegel, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Scheller, Schilling. Um, all of these guys are, are part of this sort of post-Kantian um, and kind of post-Hegelian response to things. So that's, that's just sort of the soup of philosophy that was going on before the 19th century has finished. And then some exciting stuff happens. Frege and Peirce, um, Frege in Jena in, um, in the German-speaking world, I think it might have been technically in Austria, um, and Peirce in America, independently discover first-order logic. And so they've got a more powerful logic than we had before, the kind of logic that you will all use. It's the one where we can use a backwards E or an upside down A to quantify over things. Um, and that leads to a revolution in philosophy. Um, so with Frege and then Bertrand Russell in England, who was one of the main popularizers of Frege's work, we get huge developments in logic. Now, our friend Alfred North Whitehead needs mentioning again here because he co-authored with Russell the Principia Mathematica that attempts to found the whole of maths in set theory. So Whitehead is no logical slouch himself. Okay, so then we get the Vienna Circle with Carnap and Moritz Schlick, um, who we mentioned earlier. They're trying to unify the sciences on the basis of logic, and they're really doubling down on this Humean approach. We're going to use logic. We're going to use sense experience. We're going to explain everything in the most scientifically robust and minimal terms. And they basically fell through with one really easy question. How can you prove that your method works using only the terms that you restrict yourself to? How in, in purely like empiricist terms can you explain the validity of your method? They couldn't. Um, but that leads to this approach. Um, Quine was a student of Carnap's. Um, so Quine, Carnap and Schlick all thought metaphysics was a dirty word. The idea of describing reality in any other than scientific ways was terrible. We should get rid of it. And then you get sort of Quine going, well, look, science is just an extension of common sense, really. And then Lewis goes, well, look, metaphysics is just our most general kind of attempt to make sense of things. And we're going to have it as just being a, a broad extension of, of science where we're dealing with particularly theoretical considerations. And that's the tradition I was brought up in. So brought up reading Quine and Lewis. And so that condition, tradition continues and is the mainstream one in the Anglophone world. Um, William James um, and Dewey were both pragmatists. Um, they were both um, part, so pragmatism was founded by Peirce, but the name was popularized by James. And then he went, but Peirce came up with this. Peirce is the real genius here, guys. Um, Peirce, if you want to imagine him, is the black adder of philosophy. He was extremely rude to other people and consequently never held down an academic job. Did some absolutely brilliant stuff as a, a kind of polymath. His philosophy of science is incredible. Um, but even when someone like William James was trying to promote him, he then changes the name of his view to pragmaticism with the barb a name ugly enough, I trust, to be safe from theft. Um, but yeah, so I am personally extremely influenced by Percy and pragmatism. 
Um, and I think there's a huge amount to learn from that. So pragmatism is kind of carrying on. Some of it went into influence Quine um, and Lewis, but, but they kind of missed some of the good stuff. And there are some people like me who are carrying on the tradition to this day. Then we've got process philosophy. So process philosophy, as I said, really kicks off with Whitehead. But we've got Henri Bergson, um, the French philosopher, um, the person largely responsible for stopping Einstein getting a Nobel Prize for his discovery of relativity because he was so famous a philosopher of time. He assured everybody that Einstein was wrong about time and, um, and enough people believed him um, and indeed, people still defend it. There's, there's still the, the bergson Einstein debate. People still take different sides on. Um, because Bergson was saying something really important about the human condition that Einstein didn't get. We're not going to relitigate that debate, but um, that's, that's kind of where Bergson fits in here. Um, Samuel Alexander, very much worth mentioning. So he was the first... Jewish fellow of an Oxbridge coll college and took this kind of Hegelian view. Um, but he thought that space and time were the basic things. Life was an emergent thing from that. Um, and then mind was emergent from life. And then eventually at the end of the universe, God would emerge. So it's a kind of theistic view, but one where God isn't here yet. He's going to emerge later. Um, but that was kind of very influential um, to Whitehead and indeed a, a few other philosophers and became really popular in Australia. Um, we get the ph phenomenological tradition, which really kicks off with Edmund Husserl in Germany um, and then various other people. Um, Martin Heidegger, Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, um, really interesting stuff. And then that kind of leads into critical theory later, and then we get kind of critical realism out of that. And then people like John Mingers are, are really inspired by critical realism. Um, and, and that's where that stuff comes in. Phenomenology is interested in lived experience. So every time you, you hear an appeal to Speaking to stakeholders because we're interested in what their lived experience is, that's an appeal to phenomenology. Um, and of course, there was a huge amount of cross influence between process philosophy, phenomenology and pragmatism in that golden age of philosophy in the 1920s um, up until the kind of start of the Second World War, at which point these different traditions stopped talking to each other. Um, and OR kind of really gets going post-war and the philosophers kind of stop talking to the OR people as well because we've all got our own different disciplines and our own journals and there's no reason why we would ever need to talk to each other and that's one of the things I'm trying to break today so thank you for joining me in the revolution um okay so just yeah so we've had Schlick now we've had James and Dewey um and we recognize where those fits in. So right, so the contemporary situation, we've got this hard and soft OR boundaries, systems thinking kind of straddles it. It's very much on the soft side in a lot of cases, but someone like Stafford Beer thought he was doing hard OR. He had measures for how well a system was doing. Um, and we've got a bunch of different approach um, approaches on the table to describing systems. One of the things that as a new entrant to this field I get slightly cynical about is because it's business, it feels like people are trying to trademark their own particular approach, which is a subtle variation on one of the other approaches. But this one, you know, um, this, this one is the one that I'm selling. So it's better than all of the others. Um, and maybe I can sell process philosophy to you on those terms. Oh, this is like the systems thinking you've had, but with extra fancy. But the way I think about it is these are all different approaches to more or less the same problem space. And how in 
in exact detail we think about things might just be very dependent on what we're trying to do. But as I told you on the previous slide, I'm a pragmatist. Um, so we're focused on systems that are usually too complex to predict straightforwardly and to measure with straightforward key performance indicators. You're going to want to do something slightly more. Um, we're often going to be interested, um, particularly with sort of Checkland soft systems methodology and, and various problem structuring approaches in cases where we've got multiple stakeholders with competing interests. And we're trying to think about how those interests relate to each other. Um, and one of the things I've picked up fairly quickly in this area is that there's a few people carrying a chip on their shoulder about um, challenges from their hard OR colleagues that um, we're not dealing with sort of repeatable um, replicatable experiments. We're dealing with things where there's past dependency, so their current state de depends very strongly on their history, and huge amounts of historical contingency. So what, what is going to work just really depends on which people you can persuade to get into a room and thrash ideas out. Um, these are both really Hegelian sounding features of a system of thought, that, that that historical contingency and that unfolding of history over time in this path dependent way um, is, is pretty much the hallmark of, of an Hegelian approach. And, um, and so that sort of response to Kant We've got it in the hard soft OR distinction. Are we going really empiricist? Everything is data driven. We're only saying things that you can um, that you can get like detailed evidence for that particular claim. Or are we thinking, look, we're dealing with this complex, historically contingent, path dependent unfolding of history. Um, so, so I'm recognizing all of that joyfully from philosophy. Um, okay, so let's just throw some philosophy at you to build up what process philosophy is. So here's a bunch of distinctions um, that are really big in 20th century philosophy. Um, so first one is atomism versus holism. So atomism is we're interested in describing nature by breaking it down into logical atoms so propositions, P or Q, that have truth values, true or false. Um, so anything when you're dealing with, you know, Boolean operations, you know, this is true, that's false. Um, and these are meant to be the smallest possible cases of those. And then you can build up more complex operations out of those. So you look at logical relations. These might be the truth functional connectives, the Boolean uh, connectives. Or it might be anything like is to the left of, or is taller than, or is encompassed within any relation you want. And then we provide a logical analysis of that relation and, um, and some way of building everything up from tiny, tiny atoms. Um, so everything is very compositional. Um, and of course, this process, this, this approach isn't a bad one. It has on its side of the scorecard, the invention of the computer. You know, the idea of breaking things down into ones and zeros and then building up more complex things from that is exactly this atomistic thing. So we can trace a pretty much direct line from Frege and Russell to Turing. Um, so then we've got holism. Um, where we look, we don't start with the, the smallest things and build up. We start with something big and then we, we try and consider it in different ways. We might tri consider it under different aspects or from different perspectives, but we're not seriously thinking it makes sense to take a small bit and extract it from the others. Um, So, uh, 
Um, this approach is really good for dealing with emergent properties um, because you just don't see them straightforwardly trying to build them up. It's only when you get a bit of complexity, you start to, to get them emerging. And we've got a nice picture of a jellyfish there as a, a classic kind of holistic thing. Um, so realism versus idealism. Um, so realism, the fundamental statement of realism about any domain is that we think that the phenomena outrun our evidence of them. So there's more to the world than we know or indeed could know. There's always going to be more to find out. Um, so when you disagree and you're realists, you think, look, there's at least one of us is wrong. You know, there's an answer that we could get at. At least one of us is wrong. And there's this pressure to change our descriptions to match reality. If, if we're wrong, the thing to change is our descriptions, not reality. Versus idealism, where to some extent, um, phenomena depend on our thought about them. Um, disagreement. Um, might not be possible, it might just be negotiation, um, or if it is possible, it might be a question of just making us sort of internally consistent in some way. Uh, reality changes based on how we think of it. Now, obviously, this is pretty broad brush stuff. Um, it gets way more specific, and particularly anything we're dealing with in organizations is going to presumably have some elements of both of these. There are some things that the world is providing where the phenomena just outrun our evidence and some things where we're collectively negotiating it um, together. But it's useful to have this kind of contrast in mind. Um, and then we've got substance versus process. So substances have independent existence. That's literally the definition of what a substance is. It's something that can exist by itself. Um, so if you ever hear about substance dualism, Descartes' view, substance dualism is the view that there are two things, mind and matter, and they both exist independently. No one thinks that, well, not a widespread view anymore because we think that the brain and the mind are linked in really important ways. Um, generally, we're thinking of substances of having some stability over time. Substances carry on being the same substances over time with more or less the same properties, maybe the same essence over time. Um, and so you can attribute properties or predicate, predicate properties to substances, but you can't predicate substances of anything. They're the thing that has properties, but nothing has, has the substance. Um, so got a couple of pictures there. Gold, classic substance. Horse, classic substance. Horses um, as a kind um, are a different, are a, a substantial kind. Um, I mean, we might think of businesses as substances in this sense. So we, you know, they just got this existence. They're stable over time. They've got some properties. Uh, contrast this with processes. Um, where, look, we just can't make sense of processes, we might think, independent of other processes. What it is to be the process that something is, is partially understood in terms of its relation to the processes that make it up or the processes um, or, and the, the processes it interacts with. Um, they are fundamentally goers on in time. They unfold over time. They are changes which change. Um, and that's going to be really crucial, that, that change is in the nature of a process. But they needn't be changes of anything. So rain is often given as one of the examples of this. That's, I mean, particularly in the French, you know, il pleut, it rains. It is raining. What is raining? No, no, just it. There is raining. Um, there isn't anything that, has, that the raining has to be a raining of. Um, Okay, so 
So we've got this thought in process philosophy, reality is not just substances and their properties. Um, it contains processes and in stronger versions of process philosophy, only processes. We needn't go that far, but some people go, no, no, we can exp explain everything in terms of processes. Um, reality is irreducibly dynamic. You cannot explain reality without explaining it as unfolding in time. And there are more or less realist versions. So Alexander's pretty realist. He thinks that space and time are just fundamental features of reality. Um, but since time is a fundamental feature of reality, it's quite processual. Whereas Bergson is much more about the human experience of, of duration. Um, and so we get contemporary process philosophy um, I think all the three people I'm going to mention are realists. Um, so here's Tina Rook in Dundee. I mean, partially this is just if you live anywhere near these people or have contact with them, phone up your, you know, email your local process philosopher, talk to them. They're probably really pleased that you're interested. So contemporary reality is so fundamentally connected and complex and is changing with such speed that traditional modes of thought which anchor thought in the unchanging and the stable are completely failing us. Like, this is the kind of quote that sounds like the kind of thing I read in an introduction to systems thinking. Um, and the quote bubbles have become misaligned there. It is the tendency of Western thought to strive for the clear and simple, its tendency to want to deal in absolutes and ideals that renders the complex, messy, interrelated nature of what there is almost invisible. Again, this seems like a classic criticism of hard OR, absence and problem structuring methods. Um, so, so I think that there really is some, some convergence going on here. Here's Helen Stewart from Leeds, thinking about why process philosophy is useful. Um, so if you're a process philosopher, both causation and explanation look different. Um, so if you're thinking about the cause of a token process, you're not only thinking about what triggers it, but also what sustains it, what keeps it on its course, what prevents it from ceasing or disintegrating. So we've got this new type of question showing up, not just why did that thing happen, but why is it unfolding in the way it is? Um, explanation too looks different. For here, we have to explain not only the occurrence of its front end, as it were, but also its course, and for that, we need a different source of explanation. Um, and John Dupre is um, at Exeter is very much going to back those things up. Um, he's a philosopher of biology, hugely interested in biology in a very kind of scientifically informed way. Um, and he, he thinks about why process philosophy is particularly useful in biology. And he goes, well, one can imagine a rock undergoing no changes at all without thereby ceasing to be a rock. A mouse in the same state of stasis is an X mouse. If we don't understand mice as having various processes going on, digestion, respiration, metabolism, these are all processes, we've not understood what makes the mouse a mouse. And in fact, he also has the example of that a mountain can be viewed as a process if you view it over a long enough time scale. It's a process of tectonic plate movement. And it's only when you have a time scale in which it's kind of particularly stable, it makes sense to think of it as a substance. So this idea that we can change what time scale we're thinking of stuff over. So we start thinking of philosophy over the course of the 20th and 21st century, rather than just what philosophers think now. And similarly with systems thinking, we, we go back to the very origins of systems thinking, seeing what processes are unfolding um, in the development of systems thinking. Um, so in the case of cancer, he thinks this changes the, the style of questions we should have. So the question we should ask first is why we ever don't get cancer. From this point of view, it's wholly unsurprising that the causes of cancer are distributed across the genetic, epigenetic, cellular, cellular tissue and environmental levels. So the idea is that cancer is just any uncontrolled mutation of cells. If you think, right, so mutation of cells is just what cells do. The question then becomes, what processes are supposed to be controlling this? Why is it we don't get cancer? 
not, you know, what things what things produce cancer is what's stopping the control the the mutation of cells from being controlled so we've got um a few common out broad commonalities here um between systems thinking and process philosophy both are straddling traditional avoid and divides in approach they're both focused on messiness and complexity they both conceive of a situation as involving interdependence um, they both reject a uh, conception of science as being kind of timeless and context free. Um, now, those are pretty broad things. It might be that you guys think, yeah, that's that's vaguely true, but there's not enough here to actually make them interesting comparators. Um, that's hopefully what will come up in questions. Um, but here are the heuristics I promised. So firstly, if you're a process philosopher, you're going to think change is normal. That's what happens anyway. The interesting thing is when you get stability, why are things stopping changing? Why are they staying the same? That's the thing that you need to put the work into explaining because processes are just the kind of things that unfold over time. And they're understood by how they unfold rather than what they are now. Um, so you take a longer view and you think, look, it's just normal that children turn into adults. It's not that they've changed to be a different type of thing. It's just um, it's just normal that that we age and change. And that's that's part of what it is to be a. A living person. Um, and so decisions when you're making decisions are not about what to change. They're about what you want to continue. Um, so that's it. Um, I'm only slightly short of the 15 minutes for questions, so I will let you guys crack on. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Graham. Really fascinating. And I think um, sort of taking that view back to uh, sort of the the origins of process philosophy, uh, you know, has been uh, immensely interesting. I I've, I've, uh, I think the as you say the, the response to Kant is a very interesting sort of area where you know looking at that sort of split and what we as you say we recognise very much in the hard uh, versus soft kind of um, you know discussions but uh, you know that's that's you know very much alive and uh, kicking in, in, in uh, you know a slightly different form uh, today so yeah very very happy to take uh, questions so um, there's um, there's a few things in the chat which I can pick up or uh, if people have got uh, things you want to sort of type in or you want to come on and um, sort of put your question directly uh, Mike go ahead Martin, hi. Um, let's see if I can turn some things on to make it a bit more personable. <laughs> Graham, <Good to> see. <laughs> thank you for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, really enjoyed that. Um, it might come as a bit of a surprise, but in a, in a dusty corner of, of engineering at the University of Bristol, a bunch of engineers um, came up with a, a, a similar idea. And in the announcement of your talk, you pointed us towards um, the work of Nicholson and Dupre. And oh, fantastic. Yeah, so that, that chapter, you know, a manifesto for a processual philosophy of biology is really quite interesting because the, the engineers that I, I've worked with had a similar view. And in fact, when they taught their students, they used to start with, Pantare, everything floats, um, and came up with a, a a sort of way of thinking about construction as everything is a process. Um, so you could think of a building, a house as a process, you know, which is uh, providing, you know, a, a safe environment, for example. And, uh, and, and ironically, uh, that's one of Aristotle's examples of a process. Yeah. So, you know, I, 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 I think there's some really interesting stuff that but what I wanted to, I want to ask, I don't want to make comments, I want to ask a question. Um, you were talking about a, a, a very sort of um, hard ontological view amongst process philosophers that, you know, all there is are processes. Um, and yet, I think, you know, one of the things about 
soft OR is is a sort of nervousness about hard ontologies and and you know a, a more of an epistemological view of of processes is that compatible with process philosophy or is that you know something that's going to cause problems even cause problems so I think most process philosophers that I know would take it as a victory to get processes in the picture at all because okay. such has been the dominance of the um all you need are substances and properties approach in philosophy that just acknowledging that there are these you know this other category of thing um they're going to be very happy with that and they're, they're still going to try and proselytize at you for for the extra thing but also look um any philosopher worth their salt i'm gonna i'm gonna start making bold claims any philosopher worth their salt is going to be okay with disagreement because that's what we do like we don't go away and do experiments apart from the ones that do mostly we don't go away and do experiments what we do is we come up with explanations for things and we try and work out who's making the best sense of stuff so mm -hmm. if you've got counter examples look i just don't think this is best explained in that way for this purpose i don't think that approach is useful um that's the kind of data that philosophers should be responding to um so any philosopher who's like no 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 i'm not going to listen to your lived experience your your expertise because the world has to be how my theory says it is that's bad philosophy like we're, we're meant to be explaining the world and that involves paying attention to it okay so uh, if, if you don't mind Another question, um, uh, Martin, I, I don't want to take up all the time here, but um, in the, the earlier parts of your talk, you, you mentioned something of the relationship through pragmatism. And um, you chased, traced a linkage um, back through Wes Churchman and Akoff, actually, as well, through Singer back to, to the American pragmatists. Um, I, I didn't quite understand the relationship between the pragmatists and, and the process philosophers, you know, who came first there. Um, they were uh, they were slightly overlapping and they were talking. I mean, so that period, you've got all of these different traditions at the same time and they're talking to each other. So um, Whitehead was hugely influenced by James. Um, the phenomenologists were also hugely influenced by James. Um, there's a lot of you know process philosophy going on um in purse potentially as well like so um particularly compared to the sort of lo the logical atomist tradition process philosophers phenomenologists and pragmatists are all going to agree that processes are are being massively underrated by that tradition Process philosophy really says, look, that's our headline thing. Processes are the thing. But pragmatism, um, very interested in sort of dynamic views of time. Thank you. Awesome. I, you know, <laughs> I could go for hours, but I won't. <laughs> we, we can come back, Mike, if there's a bit of time, if there's other things you want to ask. So I'm just keen to move on. There's, there's a few other things. So um, Matt has asked uh, about um, wh whether Marx was mentioned. Um, so, Graham, so he's to... post-Hegelian, hugely influenced by Hegel. So the whole dialectical materialism is applying Hegel's views to economics. So I was kind of including him as um, post-Hegelian. He's an influence later on critical theory, um, but he doesn't really interact with, I mean, and of course people like Sartre were huge Marxists, but he doesn't really inter interact with the metaphysical traditions that I was thinking of, like he's much more of a figure in political philosophy. Okay, that's awesome. You've, you've been kind enough to provide the um, some some suggested reading. So that suggested uh, for... reading is the Nicholson and Dupre book um, mm -hmm. that Mike Earworth just mentioned. It's open access, so don't buy it, just click the open access thing, you'll get a free PDF. Awesome. <laughs> 
that's great yeah the the hardback version 74 quid so the open access will be totally brilliant <laughs> uh, the, uh, the the first chapter the manifesto is really worth reading excellent that's, that's great uh, yeah perfect thanks 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 um yeah i think it's really good uh yeah, good good reference so uh, yeah i'm sure we'll all have a go, go and have a look at that in a, in a few minutes i'm keen to move on to Gemma. do you want to come on and ask your question Hi. Um, yes, thank you. So thank you very much for your talk. I um, found it really interesting as I consider myself quite a new systems thinker. So um, to see these underpinning philosophies and um, aligning ideas was uh, really, really insightful. So my question is more regarding, say, like the reductionism and atomism versus the holism side. So I'm wondering, mainly on a theory level, but also in practical OR, if it is imperative to adopt either stance, so have either be very empirical in your approach um, with atomism or with the more soft side with holism, and if there's any th philosophical underpinnings that advocate for, say, merging these two, or how to move forward with that, please? That's a really good question. Um... So in theory, you shouldn't be able to merge them because they're defined in opposition to each other. Mm. You know, like, um, but of course, in practice, it's not like you're choosing between the smallest, you know, let's go down to the quantum, the quantum level versus the whole universe. Like in practice, when you're working out what it is you're investigating, you've got a choice about kind of what level to go in at. Um, and you can go for a middle option, which is literally go in at the middle level. So rather than let's start at the whole organization and then think about how we find things within that and we, we look at the whole organization sort of and have functions going on within that versus taking like one person's job and thinking, like, let's look at every job description and then build up the organization from there. You could go, right, we've got a bunch of departments. Those departments collectively form an organization, but are made up of various different processes going on that, that allows those, um, those things to function. So, I mean, to think of Stafford Beer's VSM, like, he, he really, I mean, it, he says some strange stuff, but he really thinks that you're going to have systems going down to the very smallest possible physical systems up to the entire universe. Mm -hmm. And, but what you should do is work out what system you're interested in and always be aware that there are going to be levels below and levels above. So he's a kind of advocate for that. Um, the, the middle level is the interesting one approach. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Graham. Um, moving on, just in view, we've got, we've got a little bit of time left. That's fine. Um, so uh, Terence is asking, uh, is causality, causality an essential aspect of process philosophy uh, and the same for prediction? Um, so in the context in which I mentioned them, um, these were philosophers trying to justify why we might be interested in this approach. And Prediction, explanation, and control are the kind of things that philosophers can go, look, you care about those, right? You want to attribute responsibility to things and you want to, you know, explain why things happen. You want to make things happen. We're interested in explaining those phenomena. So, so that's why those examples were getting appealed to. But I think in process philosophy, um, Causation is going to be pretty essential um, to understand. You know, we're, we're thinking of the world as processes which influence other processes, and that influence is going to be causal. Um, it's just we're going to be thinking about causation slightly differently. It's not one thing happens, then another. It's a kind of unfolding. Um, I mean, so process, is process philosophy irrelevant without prediction? Well, it might be, I mean, it depends what you're trying to do, right? So if you're trying to explain the past, 
prediction might not be that important. Um, if you're trying to explain the future, prediction might be much more important. Um, but in general, yeah, so you're, you're thinking about a sort of description of nature and how it fits together. Causation, if you believe in it, some people are trying to get rid of it. Um, Bertrand Russell had the famous line that there's no causation in physics. Um, we only tolerate cause talk of causation because we er erroneously believe, like the monarchy, that it does no harm. And this has led to a view known as uh, causal republicanism, in which they think we should just get rid of talk of causation um, from metaphysics, that, that instead we should be doing something else. But um, it's particularly good for thinking about causation in a slightly richer way than merely what led to something is process philosophy modernist or postmodernist? I suspect, I don't know. I mean, so most of the traditions that I've been talking about don't really have that distinction. Um, so it's post Kantian, um, which gets you quite a long way to postmodern, I guess. I mean, so someone like Quine, who, who is, is the, the least interesting and radical of the people I've mentioned, um, technically might be postmodern in that he thinks that the truth isn't just something out there that we find. Um, but postmodernism is likely to be associated with, with idealism to some extent, but it needn't be as, as we see in critical realism. So yeah, I'm not sure the question has application straightforwardly to these kind of approaches. Awesome. Can I suggest, uh, Kothik, you've got a slightly longer question. Do you want to come on and ask, Graham, your, your question? Um, I can do, yes. Can you hear me? Hi, I can hear you. Hi, That's great. That's um, great. <laughs> thanks for chat. You know, we, we obviously met the OR conference, and I was thinking about, you know, with, with philosophy, you have this idea of process philosophy that is very similar, in a sense, to things we're, we're, I'm interested in when it comes to computer systems and the idea of the process and algorithms. But at some stage, you go from kind of thinking about something to de dealing with real world complexity. So, as a philosopher, if you went into a situation and you were trying to understand what was going on, you know, you see, obviously, my, my interest in tools and this in, in, in this space, how would you go about that, you know, gathering data, understanding the actual complexity of real world situations? I mean, there's a famous joke. I mean, so the, the Beyond the Fringe sketch of Oxford philosophy is, you know, someone going into a shop in, in this real world situation. Um, and then the other philosopher says, oh, and, and did you help them? Like, no, they were awfully busy. Um, so how would I go into a situation? I guess I'm thinking of this as, as being most useful as problem structuring, right? So you're working out what it is that you're dealing with. Are you dealing with things that just have properties? You get a spreadsheet, you put the name of the thing, you put its property in. That's, that's the kind of substance ontology approach where you just have a field. Or are we thinking, right, so there's the thing I'm interested in. We're going to need to represent as a trend over time or as something, um, something temporarily extended. So rather than just having a thing and its property, I'm going to have its properties represented as a kind of continuous Stream. So, so just what data I need, I'm going to be much more interested in sort of time series analysis than I am on um, just sort of descriptive statistics of what things are at the moment. Like that's going to be the kind of distant difference that, that it's going to turn into in practice, I guess. And in fact, causal models, like so some, some nice kind of Bayesian causal models. Um, so an old friend of Dupre's from, um, from Stanford, I think it was, and Nancy Cartwright is not strictly speaking a process philosopher, but she is one of the big philosophers of social science working. Um, and her work thinking about how you apply philosophy of social science in real cases, real complex, messy cases, she is the standout philosopher for that kind of approach and has got lots of case studies that she's done. What was the name again? Nancy Cartwright. Nancy Cartwright. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thanks, Graham.